Good morning. It's good to see all of you out on this wonderful foggy morning this morning. It's nice to get out, and, but at least we're able to still get out, and I hope you all had a very joyous and Merry Christmas. So if you would like to open with a word of prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank thee again for this day. We thank for the opportunity to come to your house to worship you. We just ask, dear Lord, now you are with each one of us and be with those that are absent from us for whatever reason, Lord. Just keep your hand upon us, and we ask a special blessing upon John as he brings us your word this morning. We ask this in thy precious name, dear Jesus. Amen. And the scripture for this morning is Romans 13, 1, 11 through 12. <coughs> Excuse me. And do this, understanding the present time, the hour has come for you to wake up from your slumber, because our salvation is nearer now than when we first believed. The night is nearly over, the day is almost here. So let us put aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. I'm volunteering to lead music today. <laughs> I, I thought this might be, an, uh, I had, well... I'm not, as, I'm not as organized as I'd like to be, but I do want to invite you to take your blue hymnal supplement. It's a thin uh, book in the rack in front of you, and it's 1045, not 1095. It's printed in your bulletin, the We Three Kings 1045. I will, uh, let's do, uh, I don't know, you can't really sing this song without singing all the verses because it's all part of the narrative. So I think, um, I don't know, is that what you have slides for all of them? All the verses? All right. So we're going to do every song, every verse of the We Three Kings. It's on two pages if you need the hymn book. And uh, we're ready. I'm going to follow you, Marta. <laughs> we three kings of Orient are Bearing gifts we traverse afar Field and fountain, moor and mountain Following yonder Star of wonder, star of night, star with royal beauty bright, westward leading, still proceeding, guide us to thy perfect light. Born a king on Bethlehem's plain, gold I bring to crown him again. King forever, ceasing never, over us all to reign. Oh, star of wonder, star of night, star with royal beauty bright, westward leading, still proceeding, guide us to thy perfect light. Frankincense to offer have I, incense owns a deity high. Prayer and praising voices raising over us all in high. Oh, star of wonder, star of night, star with royal beauty bright. Westward leading, still proceeding, guide us to thy perfect light. Myrrh is mine, its bitter perfume, breathes a life of gathering gloom. Sorrowing, sighing, bleeding, dying, sealed in a stone cold tomb. Oh, Star of wonder, star of night, star with royal beauty bright, westward leading, still proceeding, guide us to thy perfect light. Glorious now, behold him arise, King and God and sacrifice. 
Alleluia, Alleluia, peals through the earth and skies. Oh, oh, star of wonder, star of night, star with royal beauty bright, westward leading, still proceeding, guide us to thy perfect light. You can stay standing if you want. You can sit down if you'd like. I'd like to invite you to turn to 343 in the hymnal if you'd like, or I believe up here will be posted the words. Is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. When darkness veils his loving face, I rest upon unchanging grace In every rough and stormy gale My anchor holds within the veil On Christ the solid rock I stand All other ground is sinking sand All other ground is sinking sand when he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found, clad in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. On Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand, all other ground is sinking sand. Amen to that. You may be seated. I'd like to invite the kids to come forward. We're back over here. Not today? All right. <laughs> we, it's a little, little bit that way. It, most people get a little bit... Uh, Oh, Christmas can be a little busy for some people and they get a little tired and maybe they want to spend a little more time with their family or out of town. So we're going to accept that. And your socks don't match, man. That's cool. That's okay. All right, that's all right. Today, we're going to talk about a person in the Bible, a character in the Bible, which I'm guessing that you guys know pretty well or at least know of. Here's my guess. It's not Samuel. It's John the Baptist. You guys heard about him? The whole book. Yeah, that's all right. Yeah, so what can you tell me about John the Baptist? Was he born before or after Jesus? Before. Because yeah. he was getting them ready. Yes, because he was preparing the way, absolutely. So we have this person who probably may have been related to Jesus, who gets born just a little bit before Jesus, and his whole purpose is to prepare the way to get people ready for Jesus. Why do it, it, that, to me, I think that tells me that Jesus is pretty important, right? Yeah? If you've got a whole person whose whole job it is to come and get people ready for Jesus, that's a pretty important job, but it means that whoever's coming is more important. So can you tell me a little about John the Baptist? What kind of clothes did he wear? You remember this one? Yep. Yeah, locusts and wild honey. So the Bible, the passage we're going to read in, Luke, or in, in Mark talks about him wearing a camel hair, which I don't know if that was like a camel skin that was, had the hair on it or if it was like they, they, they took the hair and made a wool coat or something out of it. Either way, it probably would be pretty itchy, wouldn't it? Pretty rough. And he had a leather belt around his waist. We're talking about John the Baptist. So, yeah, and he's got a leather belt around the waist, and he ate bugs and wild honey. 
Why do you think he ate bugs or locusts and wild honey? Because he was poor? Maybe. He lived out in the wilderness, and that's what would have been there. And uh, <laughs> You got it. That's next week. We're going to talk about that, that whole thing next week. But what I want you to think about today is that God prepared this person, John the Baptist, and he was quite a character, and he was out in the desert, and he was preaching to people, and he was calling them to repentance and doing all this stuff. But all of that was just to get ready for Jesus, to get people ready for Jesus. Smoothing out the path. Getting them ready. Exactly. So, if God sent this special person to get people ready for Jesus, how important do you think Jesus is? Pretty important. Pretty special. Absolutely. Yeah. I think so. So, here's what we're going to think about today. That if John the Baptist is important, the person that John the Baptist is getting people ready for is even more important. Okay? So, let's pray together. Dear Lord, we thank you that you sent John the Baptist, that he got people ready, and we recognize that John the Baptist was just that, the forerunner, the person that came before, that smoothed out the road and got folks ready for Jesus to come. And Jesus is really why we're here. It's not about John the Baptist, it's not about any of us, but it's about Jesus. And so we pray that you would help us to learn to live the way Jesus lived and to do what Jesus taught us to do and to be faithful the way he was. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so there's those. You can grab one if you'd like. Why don't you grab one for your brother there, too? I want to invite you to take your Bibles and turn to Mark's gospel the second gospel not the second gospel in chronology but the second one in the bible and uh, we're going to look at the first chapter of mark the first eight verses mark writes in the beginning this is excuse me the beginning of the good news about jesus the messiah the son of god as it is written in the in isaiah the prophet I will send my messenger ahead of you who will prepare your way, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. And so John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him. Confessing their sins, they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. John wore clothing made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist and he ate, what did he eat? Locusts and honey, exactly. And this was his message. After me comes the one more powerful than I, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Yesterday, was Boxing Day. How many of you know about Boxing Day? Maybe a few folks that are especially, yeah, that uh, it's Boxing Day. It's kind of an obscure holiday. Uh, it's not even really a, a holy day. It's just as much, it, basically it's an extension of Christmas. Boxing Day, and this is particularly in countries that are associated with Great Britain, uh, Boxing Day was a day when boxes of treats and, and leftovers and everything would be delivered to the staff of the big manor houses. So you had these houses and the folks that lived upstairs, and then you had everybody downstairs who took care of them and, and, and put the, set the table and cooked all the food and everything. Well, all the staff had to work on Christmas to make sure the family got everything that they wanted for Christmas, but the next day, the following day, was their day off, and the members of the household would, would gather up the food and take it to them, and, and they would have this day, and that's Boxing Day. 
Now, in other places, Boxing Day has come to mean something else. It's the day that you box everything up after the holidays, after Christmas is over, all the decorations and all the supplies, and and you put it away for the year. Other places, people say, well, that's when you put everything back in the box that you got and was the wrong size or the wrong color and take it back and exchange it. Whatever it is, whatever the practice, Boxing Day is sort of the, the last hurrah Uh, of the Christmas for the season. Unless you want to extend it through to Epiphany on January 6th. Boxing Day, that's the close of the Christmas tradition for another year. See, this is usually what we do with traditions. When the season ends, we put the things away and we kind of forget about them until they sneak up on us again and we say, oh my goodness, I was going to take more time to get ready this year and and I didn't. I, I've been thinking a little about traditions recently. We talked about them this morning, about traditional foods that we like to eat during the holiday season. But I've been thinking about this. In last week's newsletter, I, I said that traditions are things that we do at regular intervals of time, whether it be a week or a month or a year, something that helps us remember all the other times when we, we've done those things. And Christmas, Christmas is full of traditions. But traditions have to be put away. They have to be boxed up. Otherwise, they're not really traditions. If we keep all the de- Christmas decorations up all year, they're not so special. Eventually, the tree's going to lose all its needles, and you'll have to vacuum them all up, and it's not a lot of fun. So we usually put things away so that it, they maintain their traditionalness, and they don't become just part of our everyday life. But here's the tricky thing, particularly about holidays that are really, truly holy days. There's a bigger truth that is associated with the day, the celebration, that can sometimes get a little obscured and hidden in all of the traditional observances. Christmas, in particular, is problematic. I hope that the majesty of Emmanuel, God with us, is not boxed up with the ornaments and tossed out with the plastic packaging and all the wrapping paper. It would be the worst thing that we could do to try to box up Jesus for another season. Instead of cleaning up and putting things away for the year, we still need to hang on to that sense of anticipation. We need to prepare. What I want to do for the next few months, uh, actually it's going to take a little longer than this, I want to do a deep dive into Mark's gospel. Uh, We're going to do an every verse examination of of Mark's book, and we're going to take some time to do it. Now, we'll pull away every once in a while and, and kind of get our breath and gain a little perspective. And, and we're going to be using the whole of Scripture to help us understand what Mark is writing. But ultimately, I hope that this, this close study of Mark will give us a better idea of what the evangelist is trying to tell us. And more importantly, I hope that we get to know Jesus a little better. See, our faith as Christians is all about Jesus. Jesus is the core, the author and the perfecter the, of our faith, the head, the origin, the reason for what we believed. Jesus is the one that saves. Jesus gives us a path to follow, and Jesus makes following that path possible. And so we need to know Jesus. This is who we are. And to know Jesus, we need to know the Gospels. See, Jesus is not a once in a while, occasional thing. And Jesus is not a tradition. As Mark says in his introduction, Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, the Son of God, alive and active today. And when Jesus calls us to come and follow, we need to know the way. We need to begin at the beginning then, obviously. Uh, The first verses of this first chapter of Mark's gospel. Verse 1, it serves as something of an introduction or even perhaps if you want to look at it like a title. Uh, But I don't want us to overlook it. We need to take a close look at it because he's saying some important things here. Mark's already saying, the the, the, getting to the the core theology here. Mark's the shortest of all the four Gospels. He doesn't waste words. He gets right to it. The beginning of the good news about Jesus the Messiah, the Christ. That's That's a title the anointed one, it's not his name, the Son of God. And so what do we see in that first line? So the beginning, the first word in the Greek is is arche. 
It's the, it's the same word that we find in the Greek Old Testament that starts the whole thing off in Genesis 1.1, in the beginning. Now, that could be a coincidence, uh, but I don't know. I wonder if Mark is intentionally hinting at that Genesis passage here, uh, sort of the way that John also does it in the introduction of his gospel. It's like they're trying to say that, that uh, this is something big happening. This is something really immense happening on the same scale or beyond uh, of the creation of the entire cosmos. This is big news that we're dealing with here. But it's not just a chronological beginning, something set in time. Mark doesn't say, in the beginning. He says, this is the beginning. Now that could mean the, the commencement of things, how things start to happen, the origin of things, the first cause. Regardless of what it was that Mark was intending to say with that one word, the first words of his account clearly indicate that something big is happening. But what is it specifically the beginning of? of. Matthew calls his account a book, Biblios. Luke says that his is a, a narrative, a digesis. John's work is a testimony, martyria. Only Mark calls his account by the name that they've all adopted and taken on. His is a euanglion. It is a gospel. This is the good news. This is the good news. And it's not a genre. It's not a format. Don't go 